that was fighting for gay rights mm -hmm. and people were killed. Nobody they were killed at Stonewall. Nobody was Nobody killed. Was All right, I know what you're thinking. Why is Lady Bunny the topic for this week's video? Well, it's really quite simple. Because without Lady Bunny, the drag world today might not look the way it does now. Whether that's a good or bad thing, I'll leave it up to you to decide. So, as someone that was introduced to Lady Bunny through RuPaul's Drag Race, with the many references they've made to her in over the past decade, I've only known sort of the surface of who she is, was, and will continue to be. Because Lady Bunny is not just a drag queen or an individual, she's a legend that will live on forever and ever and ever. But before we start, this video is sponsored by Colon Broom. It's important to remember that your well-being starts from within. That's why Colon Broom focuses on making sure that you're staying on top of your body's health. Colon Broom is a fiber-based supplement that contains a blend of dietary fibers that help bulk your stool and promotes healthy bowel movements. I've actually used Colon Broom for a couple weeks now and it's been a complete game changer. As someone that's always been iffy about trying supplements, I can honestly say that Colon Broom has made a noticeable positive difference in my life. Colon Broom focuses on using natural goodness, which is why their formula is carefully crafted with a powerful blend of ingredients, such as psyllium husk that keeps your bowel movements ready. Regular, while aloe vera soothes your gut. Probiotics work their way in supporting a healthy gut flora, and flax seeds bring their antioxidants and anti-inflammatory benefits to the mix. Plus, using colon broom is a breeze. Just mix one scoop with water, juice, or your favorite beverage. Make sure to stick to the recommended dosage for best results. Right now, colon broom is giving away a 65% discount on select products, and if you use code GREENGATE10, you can get an extra 10% off. Honestly, you should just try it out. That way, we can all brag about having healthy colons together. Now back to the video. If your understanding of Lady Bunny is only limited to RuPaul's Drag Race, I don't blame you. Although, even what we get to see of her on the show tends to be jokes about her rather than acknowledgements of her history or impact on gay culture. I sometimes wonder why, despite RuPaul always talking about Lady Bunny, that we've still never seen her as a guest judge on the panel. I mean, sure, we saw her on Drag U, but not only is Drag U something that should be erased from the public mind, it isn't exactly a place to really showcase her to viewers given that the main audience of the show only watches the main series. She also hired a makeup artist to do her face in the Drag U appearances, which explains why she Look so stunning. Yet, how could you not recognize her as an icon? The name Lady Bunny in itself is one of the better drag names because it sticks out from the crowd. Something that has been a benefit to her career. Because Lady Bunny has a very unique aesthetic, such as the huge blonde wig stacked on top of her head, minimalist makeup, and her performances relying heavily on comedy, while bringing out one-liners and doing a little shuffle dance afterwards. I went to see a therapist. I said, I'm not sure if I'm a man or a woman. He said, just pull your pants down. I said, you're a woman. Most of us only really know Bunny as one of the older generation queens that still exist in modern times. The fact that she's been around for so long makes a lot of us forget that she was once a young person with a bright future ahead of her. She said many times that the best year of her life was when she was at the age of 11. Her family moved to West Africa due to an opportunity that was given to her father. It's there that she had one of the most freeing times of her life, especially remembering the big banana trees that were near her house. And bananas wouldn't be the only long fruits that she'd grow to love. My first impression of Lady Bunny was that she seemed to stand out from the rest of the queens and had a very special presence about her. I guess it helps that her aesthetic is so defined that makes her instantly recognizable to people. The only time that she was on the main series of Drag Race was to celebrate her funeral in All Stars 4, which is a really good parallel to her friendship with Rue that's built upon them basically making fun of each other. It's why Alaska's choice to play Lady Bunny for the Season 5 Snatch Game was so smart, because it pandered to Rue's history in a manner that was hard for it to fail. It was also the first time I ever heard of Lady Bunny. Plus, she's a very wild individual. Like, she was literally just 13 years old when she snuck into her first gay bar to watch some drag queens perform. Which honestly, I noticed is a common trend around drag queens, but that's a story for another day. Her drag aesthetic is something that she strongly sticks by to the point where there's barely any images or footage of Lady Bunny out of drag. While there is some images of her, I chose not to put it in this video. Out of respect for Della. We also see a lot of similarities drawn between Trixie's aesthetic and Lady Bunny's. Not in regards to makeup, but really just them having big blonde wigs. And just one look Trixie did on All Stars 3, which I like to take as a direct tribute to Lady Bunny's iconic look. What makes Lady Bunny different from other queens is that entertainers like Lady Bunny have walked the walk. They experienced the gay nightlife when it was at its worst, with the least amount of societal support. Like, she's been prevalent in the scene as early as the 1980s, and went through a lot of challenges that the community faced. Experiences that people in the gay world today could never even fathom. So, it's weird to see people come for legendary queens like her so easily, and sort 
sort of discredit all the work she's done so flippantly, which is something that also happens to RuPaul a lot. But Lady Bunny isn't squeaky clean. She's gotten called out in recent years for sometimes giving takes on issues that may not be the most acceptable. For example, Bunny doesn't believe in political correctness. Her stand-up comedy is about poking at things that people find to be sensitive topics and shocking them into a laugh. She really does represent the older generation of drag, so I can see it becoming difficult to see how much the culture has changed, and subsequently needing to adapt. It kind of happens to RuPaul a lot, who for a while had a specific outlook on what type of drag queen should be allowed on the show, eventually evolving that view into being more inclusive. Bunny's point of view is that we don't make horrible things in the world go away just by not talking about it. She also points out that a lot of times, the bullying of the LGBT community can come from within the community itself, with many of the younger fans of the show holding queens to a standard that if it isn't met 100% of the time, then they automatically get piled on for not being perfect. It's important, according to Bunny, to remember who the real enemy is. This year alone, we have conservative parties in many countries trying to ban the existence of trans people and drag queens. In a recent interview, Bunny said, quote, I think it's ridiculous that Republicans are saying that drag queens are sexually grooming kids at Drag Queen Story Hour. We are not grooming kids at the library. Republicans don't seem to know that the luscious hips and boobs that they're seeing are actually foam, rubber, and breastplates. The overly sexualizing of drag queens can sometimes even be present within the fans of the show itself, with many fans accusing Jimbo of doing that by having overly large breasts as part of his gag, and critiquing her for choosing to have big boobs as part of his main aesthetic. Like, Republicans already view all type of drag queens as inherently sexual things, regardless of their breast size. So going after Jimbo with that same argument only reinforces that same view. Yet, then again, while Lady Bunny can sometimes make jokes that not everyone will agree with, it's very clear where her support lies. And that's with our community. Lady Bunny says that she has always had an affinity for trans women and has considered transitioning herself. She spends her public life in drag and uses she, her pronouns, and has even gotten a lot of infamy for always being in drag, and there being barely any pictures or footage of her out of drag. In 2022, she said that if she had to label herself, she would mostly identify as non-binary, but it isn't something that she feels the need to enforce all the time to people, because she isn't the biggest fan of labels. While I was making this video, something that helped me better understand Bunny's perspective in life was going into her past and seeing the timeline of events that led to where she is now. As we know, in the early 1980s is when Lady Bunny and RuPaul would meet each other, creating a friendship that would jumpstart both of their careers in drag. They met in Atlanta, Georgia, and for a time, they were both go-go dancers for a band called The Now Explosion. Eventually, they became very recognizable to people within the gay community there, which is how they connected to the founders of World of Wonder, which I go into in this video, so check that out if you want to hear more about it. We also would go on to learn on the All Stars 4 episode, where they invited Lady Bunny to celebrate her funeral, that RuPaul was responsible for putting her in drag for the very first time, technically making him her drag mother. But obviously neither of them have said they belong to the same drag family, so. RuPaul and Lady Bunny later moved to New York City together in 1984. It's there where they had regular gigs at a bar called The Pyramid Club. There's actually so much footage available of this time period for both Lady Bunny and RuPaul's life on YouTube, specifically thanks to an individual called Nelson Sullivan, who spent a good amount of his time documenting his journey around the gay village, along with interactions with his friends like Ru and Bunny. Nelson Sullivan was for a long time Lady Bunny's roommate. At the time, she didn't really like how he'd be filming her all the time, and it was hard to understand why anyone would find it interesting to watch footage of her just being candid behind the scenes as she got dressed for some of her shows. But looking back at it now, she realizes that it's archived footage of a moment in time that would serve as a precedent to the golden era of drag culture. Bunny's going to do her show at Mars. She's going on any minute now, just as soon as we get to the club. Hey, are you ready yet? Everyone is ready to go. Yes, I am. How do I look? Your nails aren't dry. Well, that's because I'm wearing wet look. You can do that in the taxi, can't you, Bunny? Just yeah. don't take 14th Street. It's a delicate operation, Nelson. Which requires the consummate skill of a professional female impersonator. Unfortunately, Nelson died on July 3rd, 1989, of a heart attack, at the age of just 41 years old. I sort of heard of Nelson's name for a while, but didn't fully know who exactly he was. And learning about his early death makes me feel a lot of sorrow for him. And I hope that one day we get someone that covers his life in detail. 
because this footage he made is literally gay history. Anyways, the Pyramid Club where Rue and Bunny used to perform at actually survived for a good while, and only recently closed down in 2021 during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet, speaking of viruses, the AIDS crisis throughout the 1980s and early 90s was something that Bunny would have to experience too. She explained how there was a point of time where every single week she'd show up to one of her gigs at a bar, and she'd find out that yet another friend of hers had died of AIDS. There was close to no support from the government at this time, and social acceptance of the queer community was at an all-time low. It made being a drag queen even more of a political statement than ever before. In contrast, nowadays she feels that the community isn't as together as it used to be, and isn't much of a movement. Instead, it's mostly just people online complaining about things rather than any real activism. As I said before, it's in 1983 that the dynamic duo of Lady Bunny and RuPaul moved to New York City, a place where they both shared an apartment together. One of Bunny's first times ever performing in drag was when she lip-synced to Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive, and fell during the performance losing her wig and shoe. Bunny's performance style during this period blended lip-sync, dance, and comedy. It also incorporated her making jokes that tended to be self-deprecating commentary, and short criticism of other drag queens. When RuPaul and Lady Bunny began dabbling in drag, they were not anywhere near the queens that they are today. They were struggling to even find outfits to put on and were very far from being considered glamorous. RuPaul left Lady Bunny's apartment after a couple years of living together, and took her air conditioning with her in the process, leaving Bunny without an AC system. Subsequently, at one point in the year 1984, Lady Bunny would be largely responsible for creating a big shift in drag culture. On one night, she, along with some of her drag queen friends, walked from the East Village in New York City to Tompkins Square Park, where they did a random drag show with some music. This event would go on to be an annual thing that was known as Wigstock, an LGBT event that signified the end of summer by having a big celebration of some of the best aspects of the queer community. Because the first year was so much fun, it was Bunny who decided to pioneer the event by making sure it happened every year afterwards. And so, Lady Bunny is considered to be one of the founding members of Wigstock, something that quickly became entrenched into New York City's culture. It was a very special thing because Wigstock Wigstock was born during a time of crisis in the gay community. The impact of the AIDS crisis was growing, and backlash against gay pride was rampant. So, while it served as a party for a bunch of the community, it was also a huge political statement that showcased how despite politics, they weren't going to be silenced and forced to live a life of unhappiness. Cause up until that point, most of the drag shows would happen in the privacy of indoor nightclubs, rather than in broad daylight. Therefore, Wigstock became an iconic thing for the drag community and entertainers as a whole, which lasted about 17 years, growing in popularity every time it happened. By the early 90s, the festival had become a televised global sensation. It was bringing in over 25,000 people at one point. So it was clear that this community building was something that the gay world desperately needed. Until, all of a sudden, it began to quickly lose traction largely due to the rising cost of living in New York, along with the weather making it rain for many years in a row. It came to the point that Wigstock had officially ended. Yet even long after it ended, Wigstock still maintained an effect in the gay culture. Because before Wigstock, drag queens lived a secretive life. Yet nowadays, drag is super mainstream, thanks to RuPaul bringing it to the masses. This time period that Bunny lived in isn't as far away as you think. I mean, even Peppermint from season 9 moved to New York City in the late 90s and actually got to get into the gay scene there while Lady Bunny was still actively working in it. The last year that Wigstock was held was in the year 2005, but thanks to Neil Patrick Harris and his husband David Burka, the event was revived in 2018 as a one-time thing, in an effort to document it for a documentary called Wig, which was released in 2019. It covered a lot of history behind the making of it, and I strongly recommend you watch this documentary if you want to find out more things about this time period. So there you have it. After being extremely involved with the community and trying to build it up, after Wigstock ended in 2005, Lady Bunny had entered a new era in her life. She continued to do drag, but it was never at the level of influence that it once was. Of course, eventually in 2009, RuPaul would come out with Drag Race and changes things forever. Something that always boggled my mind because I thought that we'd see Lady Bunny as a guest judge, but as mentioned before, Bunny never had much of an interest in critiquing other drag queens. Which brings me to my next point. Bunny's past with the community, along with her 
experience gives her a different outlook on life that many queer people today don't have. Bunny has said that she feels there's a contrast between the different generations of LGBT people, with the newer generation being a lot more focused on the use of pronouns and trying to put each other in boxes, while her come up in the 1960s and 70s, the community was mostly just about having each other's back and not really questioning who each individual felt they were. You were just sort of free to be yourself, no questions asked. She wishes that the community could focus more on staying together rather than trying to divide. Because according to her, there's so many issues that tend to be buried under the rug by the more privileged people in the community. Using as an example how even when people were fighting for equal marriage rights for same-sex couples, there was nobody paying attention to trans women that were being murdered and thrown in prisons. Yet, aside from politics itself, she's noticed how after the decade of RuPaul's Drag Race impact on pop culture, there's been a shift in the way that people view the concept of drag queens to begin with. As an example, when All Stars 3 was doing promo for the season, Milk got a lot of criticism for his more androgynous take on drag. According to Bunny, to say that that type of drag doesn't belong is a sort of slap in the face to the whole concept that drag was built on. In the real world, drag queens are not booked for their traumatic backstory, they are booked for their talent. She also feels that Drag Race de-emphasizes performance by making queens only lip sync if they have done poorly in an episode to a song that they can't choose and which they have to perform alongside another queen. Yet in clubs, that's not really how it's done, with queens having more autonomy over what their performance will be. The only thing that I feel could be a benefit to queens would be if the show allowed queens in the bottom to change their outfits before the lip sync, like they do on all-star seasons. There's times where it's hard to see a queen struggle in a gown while trying to turn it to a super fast-paced pop song. At the same time, there's an argument made that it should only be reserved for All-Stars queens, since they actually won the challenge. But what do you guys think? I actually recently did a poll about this, and the answer was pretty unanimous. Subsequently, I'm not sure how exactly the format of the show could be changed to cater more toward the queen's talents. Because if we're being honest, the concept of a lip sync for your life is a fun thing to watch. It's enjoyable to see what tricks a queen can bring out of their pocket, especially in a moment as tense as their possible elimination and the crushing of their dreams. So is it more important for the production of the show to be more aware of the queen's feelings, or should their focus continue to be our sole entertainment? I think about this because it's rumored that for All Stars 9, we will be getting a non-elimination format, with the cast full of non-winners. Which may be great for the queens in the cast, but will it be a detriment to the viewer's experience? Before Drag Race, there was only about 20 queens known nationally that were booked because of their performances. Now it's just about the fact that they were on television that gets them bookings. On a complete side note, could we have one cast of the main season of Drag Race be filled with nothing but older queens? I want to see more of the legends within the community be on the show, that aren't as fearful to be themselves by pandering to the audience. Plus, it's not asking for much when a lot of the recent seasons have been heavily younger queens that have been cast. But let me know if you guys could get behind that idea. I think that we'd see a lot more entertainment because nowadays we have a new generation of drag queens that grew up watching the show. So a lot of their artistic expression is based on trying to imitate queens that they saw on TV. Which isn't necessarily bad, but it also makes it harder for them to stand out from the crowd, or to really be as remembered when their season is no longer airing. That's why I like when the show gives props to queens who go out of their way to be different and push boundaries. This brings us to one of Lady Bunny's main points when it comes to the world of drag, which is that the mainstream transformation of drag due to drag race has caused a sort of elitism that has grown within the culture, such as having human hair wigs or lace fronts be indicative of your quality of drag, when really the birth of drag came from queens that didn't necessarily look the most expensive, but were just expressing themselves with what they could. It gives more appreciation to queens like Spanky Jackson, who from one way or another was someone that not anyone really expected to win her season of Down Under season 2, but she did. Because it wasn't about her drag, it was her performance as a drag character that made her shine in the eyes of the viewer and RuPaul. Mainstream also requires things to be more cookie cutter, so that it doesn't offend people. And being that some of the roots of drag came from sort of boundary pushing that at times was even grotesque, depending on the person, having to censor oneself is something that we've even seen happen on the show, with earlier seasons having a lot more on-the-nose sexual gay jokes than we see now. Which makes sense why Bunny never achieved mainstream success, because she actively goes out of her way to not pander her jokes to a more general audience. In January 2021, Lady Bunny made a podcast with Monet Exchange called Ebony and Irony, something that is surprisingly really entertaining and was a big reason why I decided to make this video. So go give it a listen if you're curious. I've also noticed that in recent years that there's been an active
active effort from many of the established crew girls to bring Lady Bunny into the international tours. While many fans may not be completely aware of who exactly she is, it's great to see them provide opportunities that tend to be only available for queens that participate on RuPaul's Drag Race. And so, Lady Bunny is literally a living icon in the community, who's done it all and experienced some of the worst hardships that the LGBT people have had to face. She may sometimes cross the line in terms of some of the things she says or jokes about certain issues, but at the end of the day, it's clear where her loyalties lie. Thank you to Colin Broom for sponsoring this video. Make sure to click the link in the description for a huge discount. I want to take a moment to thank my patrons. In the Elite Pink Squad, we have Matthew Burns, Gay Uncle, Wendell Norris Realtor, Tyler Hendricks MD, Poppers Alberta, and Sari Tish. In the Gay Squad, we have Ethan Von Queer and Emma Malander. And in the Green Squad, we have Azure, Cayman Rider Furry, Franny Fishsticks, Edgar Allan Pup, O Nicole, The Only Sean, LP, and Soy Poblete. If you'd like to see your name on the screen, you can support me on Patreon. The link will be in the description. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Like this video and comment what you thought, and I'll see you guys next time.